Welcome to ABC College Football, presented by Buffalo Wild Wings. Eugene, Oregon, the home of the number two ranked team in college football. The Mark Helfrich era is off to an outstanding start, and the Oregon Ducks are flying faster than ever, led by a dynamic duo on offense. De'Anthony is a special player. He's that type of player. He can go 60 yards in a, in a heartbeat, and um, he's really just fun to watch. I feel like I feed off Marcus. When I see him do big things, it makes me want to do big things. Today might bring a true test. The Tennessee Volunteers surging under new coach Butch Jones and looking for the upset in the Pacific Northwest. Hudson Stadium has been sold out for every home game since 1999. That's 91 straight. On this September day, it hosts an SEC Pac-12 clash as number two Oregon tries to stay perfect in 2013. Good afternoon, everybody. Mike Patrick, Ed Cunningham. It's great to have you with us. Janine Edwards will join us shortly. Two questions today. Will Tennessee give Oregon its first true test of the season? And have we seen enough of the Ducks to think they have a legitimate shot at their goal, which is to go 13-0? I think a lot of people around the SEC would say there's no way Tennessee could run with Oregon and play with them. I think they'd be wrong. This is a pretty good, pretty good group under Butch Jones, the first-year head coach. They play really hard on defense. And remember, last week against Virginia, Oregon looked sloppy at times. Virginia just didn't have the guys to play with them. But in that game, Oregon could have been beat if the team was better. I'm not saying they lose today, but I'm saying this is the first time we'll see a real test. So to answer your second question, we don't know how good Oregon is yet because I don't think they've been tested at all. Well, the real strength of Tennessee right now is easy to identify. It's the offensive line, and at least four of those five guys are said to have NFL futures. they got to lean on them. The old theory is old school, you go run the ball, and that's kind of what in the SEC they like to do, don't? Mistake Tennessee for an old school offense. They will go fast and spread it out. But this group of big men has played a lot of ball together. They're ready to go in Odson Stadium. Kickoff just moments away. Oregon and Tennessee coming up next. could always play but they wanted more the question was how the Northwest is known for innovation and sound principles that build long-term value start with infrastructure find and nurture people who know the place and how it operates aggressively innovate within industries constrained by tradition and history and make sure that a world-class marketing campaign is backed by substance how do you build a dynasty in modern college football Ask Oregon. Unfortunately, at the University of Washington, where I played, I never won in this building. But every time I've come back, I've been struck by this place when a lot of people think it's all sizzle, no steak. But the more you're around, you see the quality people that they continue to bring in. To wit, this year, because they're able to recruit not only better athletes, but smarter athletes, they are actually running a play every 17 seconds. That is three seconds faster than they ran it last year under Chip Kelly. Now, this is a new school powerhouse hosting an old school powerhouse. Tennessee with six national championships and their checkered end zones brought in a new head coach in Butch Jones this year who one of his players, Janine Edwards, said at first came across as a bit corny. But Ed, corny's okay if you're winning. You know, in 1989, at the age of 18, Butch Jones talked his way into an internship with his favorite team, the Tampa Bay Bucks. He worked in the laundry room. Well, now 24 years later, he has taken over his third consecutive program as head coach, and he told us he's had the quickest buy-in of all with these Tennessee players. No, Jones isn't a household name yet, but he's well-respected among his peers for his resilience and attention to detail. His message to his team just moments ago contained the word resilience and perseverance and making the most of every opportunity today. He can relate. Mike, he's a long way from that laundry room. Janine, he has been a head 
coach for six years, and he has won four conference championships in those six years. Butch Jones will succeed at Tennessee, and they are delighted to have him. He's a guy who was fourth on the list of head coaches that were talked about to be hired last year when they made the change from Derek Dooley, and this fan base has embraced him almost from day one. What an intense, smart guy. Tennessee won the toss, but deferred Michael Pilardi to kick to Thomas and Lowe. Blazing speed. Thomas. In the open field. D'Anthony Thomas still on his feet. Out of bounds at the 20, but there's a marker down 50 yards behind where the play ended. Oh, boy. Defensive back Isaac Dixon called for an illegal block in the back. He's number five. Left side of your screen. Yep. Well, and what the officials look at, because that looked like it was almost on the shoulder, is where the guy who was blocked, how he falls. Because the player from Tennessee fell forward instead of sideways or back. It's as Oregon comes out for offense, but that was a good call because the, the Tennessee defender fell forward. Marcus Mariota, the first quarterback in school history to rush for over 100 yards in two consecutive games. Four wide receivers, they'll throw on first down underneath, and is it complete? It is. Up at the 24, now they say no. Intended for Braylon Addison, who had a good game against Virginia. Justin Coleman on the coverage. Addison was looking for a pass interference on Justin Coleman, but it looked to me like Coleman got there right about the same time as the ball. I think that was a good no call. Marshall, the running back. They fake it to him and throw over the middle and hit their tight end, Johnny Munt, who makes his first catch of the year. There's a situation for Oregon. They have Colt Lyrla, the tight end, normally the starter and just a tremendous athlete. For an unknown reason, he is not with the ball club today. At least he wasn't 45 minutes ago. That was uh, Jake Fisher, the right tackle, who got five yards for flinching. Second penalty against the Ducks. It's third and eight. Got four wide receivers. Good protection for Mariota over the middle and incomplete to Thomas. Janine has more on Cole Lyrell. Well, Mike, I do not see him out here on the uh, Oregon sideline, and Oregon officials are telling me that they had six players this week that were ill with a stomach virus, and they missed a couple of days of practice, and Colt Lairla was one of them. He also missed some scheduled interviews, and he did not warm up with the team. What a huge loss for Oregon. A tough game for Lairla last week, but he is an explosive guy with the ball in his hands. Jacob Carter back to return the punt, does the smart thing on the bouncer, gets out of the way and lets it die inside the 30 with the roll, a punt of 53 yards. In charge of the offense, junior Justin Worley, highly recruited out of Rock Hill, South Carolina. Started three as a freshman two years ago, then played in five last year. Really lightly played through his first two seasons. What they say they want out of him is to protect the football. This is going to be a running team unless they're forced to do something else.
and he throws wide on first down intended for Brendan Downs. He's completing 68% of his passes, most of them of the short variety against inferior opposition. And the thing that will blow you away if you've never played at Austin is how loud it can be on the field. That throw there, completely off the mark. Looked a little antsy on that throw, good word. Rajon Neal is in as the running back, and Neal will get the carry. Ball came loose. Oregon football. Rajon Neal coughed it up on his first carry. Comes out late. I think that was Lay. I think that was Wade Kaylee Keepy who gets that out. Look at pick number. Well, 92 is actually blocked by the ball. Oh, that was an excellent job by Derek Malone. I saw that too. Thought it was 92, but that was 22. Derek Malone is leading this team in tackles. As the running back is held up, Malone did a wonderful job of pulling it out. The Anthony Thomas with all that speed can't turn the corner. And there is the tackling machine, A.J. Johnson, the middle linebacker who was fourth in the country last year with 138 tackles. He led the Southeastern Conference with that number. Preseason first team, all conference, Southeastern Conference. Second and nine. Little swing pass to Huff. Huff takes it near the sticks. And where they're going to mark it, he is going to have a first down at the 20. And here goes Oregon, super fast. That's the hardest part of defending them is they change their tempo. Now going fast, Tennessee seems to be lined up okay. Thank to Thomas. Pass over the middle, incomplete, intended for Huff. Good coverage there by Ladaryl McNeil, who started as a true freshman. A lot of youth in the secondary. And that was a, a lot of that had to do with the secondary had the call. They were completely aligned. Oregon doesn't do a lot of shifts in motion. And that time McNeil was able to read his keys. Good jump on the ball to break it up. Mariota fakes the toss. Looks for the end zone and just overthrown Daryl Hawkins. May have gotten a fingertip on it, but he was pretty well covered by Cameron Sutton. Excellent job by Tennessee. They just ran on four new defensive linemen. They are without Maurice Couch suspended for this ball game. So their depth issue, but they got guys in. Mariota is two out of seven to start this game. And that was the question mark for this club. His completion percentage down from a year ago, although he's had some drops, but he has not looked sharp coming out here. Numbers are way down, and, and in fairness, he had a bunch of drops last week against Virginia. Most of his throws had a couple of throwaways, so numbers were down, but uh, early in this game, that ball there uh, seemed to really float on Marcus. Alejandro Maldonado will try the field goal from 37 yards. And it's wide. Tennessee holds after a huge turnover. Great news for the Volunteers. And they'll get the ball when we come back to Oregon. Nothing, nothing. Tennessee survives a turnover. And they have the ball back at their 20-yard line. Lane is the tailback. And Lane will get the carry. A little misdirection play. Takes it up across the 25 to the 27. We'll check in with Chris Cotter. Spike time for the Taco Bell Live Moss moment. Johnny Manziel to Cameron Clear. In the big one down at Texas A&M, capping a seven-play, 84-yard drive to start the game. 7 up in a &M. Thank you, Chris. Good run on the last play by Lane. They'll use a trio of tailbacks at least. Play action fake by Worley. 
has time and throws to a wide open receiver complete to midfield down to the 30. Josh Smith still on his feet inside the 25 yard line. Smith, who had a prep career in Knoxville, where he had more than 4,000 yards receiving, gets 65 on this one. And Tennessee does have tempo after the big play. They can go fast. Here they get a line trying to catch Oregon on their heels. Good aggressive maintenance of the game, management of the game. Worley gives it to Neal. Neal powers his way to the 10-yard line. It'll be another first down. Paseco Lacombo made the tackle. We've been talking about this offensive line and how good they are. Well, once you get in the red zone, having a powerful offensive line, if you can run and throw it, gives you such a benefit. But you go back to that long throw on that play action, Worley had forever to throw that ball back to Smith. Worley has Lane with him in the backfield. Lane on the read option. Now, Oregon on that play is trying to make the quarterback keep the ball. They think he's far less dangerous with his feet than any of these running backs. But the problem for Oregon is the right side of that offensive line, Zach Fulton and Jawan James, are pushing around these yellowish, I'm not quite sure what this color is, but they're pushing around those yellow jerseys pretty handily on the right side. I I'd run at that right side again if I were Tennessee for that offensive line. Looking toward the sideline for the play call. Having trouble getting it in. Not sure why you would. It seemed like they had time to get a play, and unless they completely had the wrong personnel, not sure why you'd burn a timeout there. It seemed like they had plenty of time to make the change. Those things are very valuable. They used one with 9.48 to go in the first quarter. And now you've got a young quarterback on the road. Difficult down in distance here. Second and goal from the six. This is typically somewhere where you would think some type of fade throw into the end zone or a slant, but they really haven't had to have Worley throw the ball much. The first two games were pretty easily won. If you're going to beat the second-ranked team in the nation, certain things have to go right. Oregon's already blown a 50-yard kickoff return by a penalty. And missed a field goal. And missed a field goal after not taking advantage of the turnover. So for not, for Tennessee, so far so good. It's got to be seven, though. You get down here, you can't take three points if you're Butch Jones. You're thinking four downs all the way here. Early under center. Lane. I, that just takes I, that, that just took forever to develop I, I, the one thing Oregon can do across the field is run the ball if you've got a power offensive line don't run a delay run that eventually Oregon is athletic enough to get off the blocks of the big guys you just have to run right at them and here I think you got to think about a bootleg for your quarterback Worley not great throwing on the run but I think you want to get him away from the line of scrimmage big third down they bunch the wide receivers to the near side Dallas North and Kroom. Kroom is a huge target. And Neal comes back into the backfield. Worley looks toward those bunched receivers and throws. Touchdown! Got it to Jason Kroom. That's his first catch of the year. Two of their wideouts are huge. Kroom is 6'5", 223. Marquez North is 6'4", 215. No wonder they have a pretty good running game in addition to that line. Oregon, one of the top secondaries in the country. And that was a pretty easy just run to the back of the end zone and cut across the back for Kroom. Nice, timely, accurate throw by Worley. Pilardi for the point after. And Tennessee has stunned Oregon here in the first quarter. Perfect throw. Kroom makes the catch, his first of the year for a touchdown.
You know that one's yours, right? They've each had eight. You seven. Is it because you're a slower eater? Or not man enough to claim what's rightfully yours? First it's a wing, then it's your seat at the table. So tell me, are you a little baby boy? ESPN's College Football on ABC. Brought to you by Buffalo Wild Wings. The official hangout for NCAA football. Nissan, premier partner of the Heisman Trophy and New York Life Insurance Company. An impressive 80-yard drive in 3 minutes and 18 seconds has Tennessee on top of the second-ranked team in the nation, the Ducks of Oregon, here at home. And Tennessee getting ready to kick it away. Pilardi has it teed up. DeAnthony Thomas and Keenan Lowe are deep. What do you think about an onside kick here? A little bit of momentum on the road. Not much to lose all the game. You're not on a one-year contract, are you? <laughs> Neither is Butch Jones. <laughs> Good point. DeAnthony Thomas. His speed, particularly his acceleration, are ridiculous. And one of the stories around him here has been the percentage, uh, completion percentage for Marcus Mariota. He had a throw earlier that we missed that had been tipped on the line of scrimmage that looked inaccurate, but his feet look good, his timing looks okay. He seems to be stepping into his throws just right now, the ball getting away from him. And studying him last week and this week, he does have an, uh, uh, where he, his feet can be a little late to readjust for his throws, but so far I haven't seen that. Just been the balls floated on him a little bit, it looks like. Maybe the tip is up or... You know, some little mechanical thing. Mariota that time really just standing flat footed from where he caught the ball through it incomplete. This defense for Tennessee was atrocious last season. One of the best offenses in the country. Lost a tight end and two receivers to the NFL. But this defense is playing so much better than they did a season ago. Thomas swallowed up by that front wall and particularly Daniel McCullers at 6'5", 351. McCullers a guy who spent a little while close to 400 pounds during his time at Tennessee. A lot of people got a rude awakening when Butch Jones and his uh, off-season calisthenics program came in. A lot of weight was lost on the front line for the volunteers during the offseason. He's going to be a force. They're trying to double team him. Mariotta This is the guy they are so excited about out of Missouri City, Texas. They think he can be just a tremendous playmaker. He is already a tremendous blocker. That was a gain of 38. They go with a hurry up. Thomas. And this is the same action they got on the inside runs last week against Virginia. There's nothing there. Mariota with a great throw. There was a safety over the top. The corner Coleman was lagging behind, but uh, we talked to Coach Helfrich yesterday about running the ball inside, and Scott Frost, the offensive coordinator. Oregon will continue to do it because it does make you respect it. So even if they don't get any yardage, they're trying to set something else up. Mariota. Down the sideline, inside the five. He started this game averaging 26.1 yards a rush. 26-1. He just hurt his average. He only got 20 on that one. But this is where this offensive line excels. They're not great at getting big push, especially against the big physical defensive line. But when they get outside, they're awfully athletic. Mariota pounces on the fumble. You know, if you're a defense, you just have to be scared to death. You've got both Thomas and Mariota in the backfield. Not a great snap by Aronis Grasso, the veteran center, but looked like Mariota should have been able to handle that. Burnt a down. Second and goal. Mariota in trouble. McCullers got there first, spun him around, and then Marlon Walls gets the sack. But McCullers deserves part of the credit. McCullers does a wonderful job of keeping his feet as he goes down. Excuse me, that's Salisbury, not McCullers. Another big body in there for Tennessee who was not on their depth chart. Trevera Salisbury, number 96. 
very similar in size. So this is a guy we did not expect to play. I mentioned with Mo Couch is not here. So getting some depth guys some time trying to keep him fresh. And they'll whistle this one dead. Looks like a delay. No, they got the timeout first. Prior to the expiration of the play clock, timeout, Oregon, their first of the half. Oregon's been really sloppy so far, Ed. Uh, the little mistakes, and it's hurt them. And as, as the competition level goes up, and, and I look at this Tennessee team, and I know a lot of people around the SEC think, oh, they're gonna, they're lucky, they're gonna be lucky to get three wins within conference, and if they break 500, it'll be a miracle. After watching them and seeing their schedule, I know it's tough coming up, but seven, eight wins, I think Tennessee has that in them. Tough is not the word for this. <laughs> Interstate rivals will square off tonight on ABC Saturday Night Football. Brian Kelly takes the Irish to face the Boilermakers. Saturday Night Football presented by Windows tonight at 8 Eastern. Second time Oregon has been deep in Tennessee territory. Empty backfield from Marcus Mariota. Thomas. What a block on the outside. Now they're going to call out a hold on Keenan Lowe. This is a sloppy, sloppy looking Oregon team. They had their moments of sloppiness last week, but this is this is becoming a new low for unforced errors. If I'm Tennessee, I decline that. Yeah, I would too. I would put the punter or the uh, kicker right out there for sure. This is the last team on earth you want to get another <laughs> shot. No. Even if you back him up 10. I, yeah, what's third and 20? Big deal. Gives him two, the ability for two shots at the end zone. block back towards their own goal line. Offense number 64. A 15-yard penalty. We play third down. Tyler Johnstone, the uh, big left tackle, the Outland Trophy candidate. And you cannot block low coming back from the outside. This is one of those safety rules. You cannot go back towards your own end zone. So Oregon's end zone is behind them. That was a good call there. That play used to be illegal, but now they're saying when an offensive player is going back towards their own goal line or back in towards the ball from the outside, they're now calling that a penalty. And in Tennessee, smartly here, I agree with you, Mike, declining this penalty. And Johnstone has no one to blame but himself because he missed the initial block to set that up. And Jordan Williams, the guy he's going against, has been very active. They give him a little bit of a free rush inside. So Oregon, because of the decline penalty, deciding to go for it here on fourth down, I've got a, a very aggressive call. Why not for Oregon? They feel like... They can score all the time. Now, you, if you're Tennessee, you better be worried about Mariota with the ball in his hands on the edge because he can really run. I, I think he'd be coming here to his right. Five wide receivers, three to the near side. Mariota looks this way, throws it, and he touchdown to Anthony Thomas. When they got the football in, they fear nothing. They fear absolutely nothing. They'll go for it. What the heck? They're going to call yep. Braylon Addison for offensive pass and, interference. And it's a great call. It is absolutely the right call. This is a clear out route. Watch Addison right here. He has no, he oh. puts his hands inside. That's absolutely the right call. I know the fans are going nuts, but that was a runoff by Addison, not even attending to, uh, intending to run around. This Pac-12 crew got it absolutely right. That was the pick of picks. Yes. You have now to. You have no choice. I mean, when Addison took both of his hands and shot him inside on the defender like he was going to run block him, I think that was a key. Wogan will try from... 38 yards. They've already missed one. But Wogan succeeds where Maldonado had failed. Oregon gets on the board, but they're down 73. Fifty four thousand strong here at Otson Stadium have just seen their beloved Ducks get a field goal, but they trail 7-3. Vincent Dallas is deep to return the kickoff. He waits three yards deep in his end zone.
take a look at today's impact matchup brought to you by Chick-fil-A. Tennessee just lost a ton of talent at receiver and tight end last year, but we've seen the size, Marquez North, a true freshman, 215 pounds, 6'4", and Pig Howard, a short guy who is starting to learn the offense, was hurt last year. They expect big things out of him, and these are two of the best corners in the country in Ifo Ekpre Olamu and Terrence Mitchell. Of course, Mitchell was ejected in the first game for a targeting hit, but these guys are as good a tandem of corners as you're going to see in all of college football. Rajon Neal, who fumbled on the first series, was in as the running back. He gets the handoff. Gets about two. We check to the studio. Chris Cotter with an update. Time for the Dr. Pepper 10 conference update to the SEC and Kyle Field and down 14 to nothing already. AJ McCarron finds Kevin Norwood with 22 yards. It's 14 7 Aggies. Say what you want about Johnny Manziel. He can play some football. Neil. Boy, he had an enormous hole off the left side. Instead, he cut it right back into traffic. He might still be running if he'd gone left. The left was there, but a safety was coming down. But watch the push on this right side. They're, the Oregon Ducks on the inside were getting pushed around a little bit. I, Tennessee may have the mixture necessary to keep this game close. Empty backfield for Worley. Five wideouts. Ducks come with a three-man rush. Incomplete. Intended for a starting tight end, Brendan Downs. But outstanding coverage. Basico Lacumbo, young man who was born in the Congo. Well, we were just talking. The British Columbia had the coverage. We were just talking about the corners for Oregon. Their entire secondary coverage with their linebackers is outstanding. That time, Worley had nowhere to go. He came down to the tight end because that was the only thing close to open. So the combo even knocked that ball away. Pilardi, who is a very good directional kicker. See if he tries to keep it away from Addison or they'll kick to him. They do. Addison at the 23. He's got a seam on the right side. Braylon Addison. You can't teach speed, but holy cow, they've acquired a lot of it. 40-yard return. You talked about the directional kick. The goal for Tennessee was to kick this to the outside third of the field, not to the middle of the field. The idea for a return being set up is so much easier in the middle of the field because you can go any direction you want. That was a physical error by the putting team from Tennessee. You want to get that over by the numbers, not in the middle of the field against this speed. And there was exceptional blocking on that return for Oregon. Marshall is in it running back. Huff also number one right now in the backfield. But he'll go in motion. And they'll throw it to Huff. Got a block on the outside. And Tennessee's got it. Brian Randolph, the safety, knocked it away, and Cameron Sutton pounced on it. Not so sure this is not going to get looked at. Mark Helfrich was just looking up at the Jumbotron to see. This looked to me like Huff, like his, the ball is not coming out. That's not a fumble. So this will be reviewed. If not, I think Mark Helfrich will call the timeout and use a coach's challenge. But that ball's not moving. Yeah, and when the forearm hits, the player is down. So this is going to be... So Oregon really catches a break there. It looked like they had coughed it up. They're lucky. They, they don't have a turnover yet in their first two games in a half a quarter, a little more than a half a quarter. But this one awfully close but I think this is indisputable video evidence that this is not yes a turnover it's some really good looks at it too that he's in complete control of it until his hand hits the ground the hand in which the ball is so that's uh, the delay is in looking at this is checking the spot 
They also have to look at the clock and move it back a couple of seconds. So it gets a little complicated. So it'll take a little longer, which I think Tennessee wants. Take exactly. a little time, catch your breath. It's a great timeout. Oh, absolutely. Maybe get an orange slice or something, get you ready for the next play. <laughs> But this, I think, is an advantage to a bigger, more physical team in Tennessee. There's no doubt when you put the film on for Tennessee. I don't care what they look like this year. This is still an SEC team. They may not be the Tennessee of the late 90s. But uh, this is an awfully good group, I think, that Butch Jones. They, they may not have the offensive speed yet to compete in the SEC East, but they're sure playing hard. Huff is just holding his breath, hoping that they rule it that he was down by contact doesn't want that turnover and on his shoulders Tennessee is a team that last week against Western Kentucky set an NCAA record they had four forced turnovers in four straight plays for the opposition five out of a total of six plays I don't think anybody had ever seen anything like that sequence and it took After Western further down review, the, the ruling is the runner with the elbow is down before the ball came in So as we speculated, they have changed the ruling. It will bring up second down from the 33-yard line. And I think this was a huge break for Tennessee. If you're going to have to go back out on defense, you get a little bit of a break over the shock that you didn't cause the turnover. Thomas. Got outside, takes it down to the 25-yard line. That should be enough for a first down. That play was blown up about three times by Tennessee players, and he just continues to dip in and bounce out. He's, he's quite special. Got it again. I don't think defensively you can see how fast he is until you play against him, and then that may be too late. And it's not just the speed. His ability to cut on one foot dip in dip out you have to respect it they're going at warp speed now mario what a fake to get away throws to his wide open tight end johnny Munt touchdown mariota made a fake daryl mcneil had him dead to rights and it was i'll see you later Yeah. Now, remember, they make you defend the extra points. If you don't line up properly, they'll go for two. Last week at Virginia, we saw them go into kick formation and go for two, and they made that one. So you can't trust the Ducks on special teams. They pressure you and make you work every part of the game. Kicking special teams, excuse me, kicking offense, defense. They, they make opposing coaches lose a lot of sleep getting ready. What a move to get free and a perfect pass running to his left and a touchdown. Ducks take the lead. The Ducks of Oregon have taken a 10-7 lead. They'll kick it away. Vincent Dallas, the deep man, three yards deep, he'll bring it out. Dallas with a seam, still on his feet across the 25 to the 26-yard line. We check in with Janine Edwards. Well, Mike and Ed, you guys have been noting that Oregon's linemen have not been able to get any push against these Tennessee Volunteers, and that's something that Oregon defensive coordinator Nick Aliotti was worried about. He said, we're going to find out a lot about our team today. Well, I can tell you that when their offense has come off the field, the Oregon linemen have looked, for lack of a better word, stunned, and line coach Ron told them to settle down and play and be mindful of technique. All right, Janine, thanks very much. Neal and Lane in the backfield together. They'll throw against the blitz. Nice catch by Neal on a pass that was almost 
out of his grasp. He'll pick up about five. Avery Patterson takes him down. And defensive coordinator Nick Aliotti has been here for 21 years, three different stints over five decades. Something keeps drawing him back. I think it's the uh, seasons where they end up in big time bowl games. I, I think, think that so. might be part of the draw. And a lot of that is his responsibility. He's been a tremendous defensive coach over the years. Little inside scissor action to Neal, and he'll gain maybe one, and that's it. Derek Malone, the leading tackler on this team, the weak side linebacker was in on the stop. Big third down here for Tennessee. This is because Oregon was able to Get that touchdown, a little bit of the momentum. You do not want to put your defense back out on the field here. I think this is a throw for Worley, but don't, don't, if you're Oregon, stay home for a late draw. Three and outs against Oregon are the kiss of death. Worley on the high snap, Reed. And that could be enough for a first down to Marlon Lane. Depends on the mark, and it didn't get a very good one. No. But I think you've got to go for it. If I'm Tennessee, I go very fast and run over that right side. Let's see if the spot was accurate. Yeah, he was down right before the marker, so a good spot. I think a good idea for Tennessee. I, I'd go for it here. You're on the road. You don't want to get into a possessions game with Oregon. With this offensive line, I think this is one you go for. I know that's against all old school thinking, but this is not old school football out here. Pilardi to kick it away. This time they'll try to kick it to the sideline and do. They learn from that huge return on the last play. And Pilardi with better execution on that one. Two top ranked teams highlight ESPN's primetime doubleheader tonight at 7. Vanderbilt against the 13th ranked Gamecocks of South Carolina. Then 10:30, James White and the 20th ranked Badgers face the Sun Devils D. Both games on ESPN as well as live on Watch ESPN. Arizona State bouncing back nicely under Todd Graham last year. He's one of those coaches like Butch Jones with tons of energy, does a lot of work off the field as well as on. They're looking like they're getting better. Thomas, not much room, or Byron Marshall, not much running room this time. Taken out of bounds. Still picked up five yards. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? That a five yard run just looks like it was a terrible execution play by Oregon. The whistle this play dead. And it's going to go against the Ducks. Ball start. Offense number 75. Five yard penalty. Second down. That's the fourth flag in the first quarter against Oregon. They were troubled by penalties a week ago. Still, as fast as they operate, I'm amazed they don't have a penalty every other play. Well, one thing we were talking about with the coaches yesterday, because of the upswing in talent, they're able to recruit smarter players. They weed out people and say, you, you, may not, you may not be able to pick it up, so they've actually gotten faster. Pass underneath to Lowe, and Lowe makes the catch, and then is crash as he gets to the 29-yard line. Cameron Sutton with the big hit. Third down, about three. Thomas cuts it inside, and Thomas showing some power there. Dragging tacklers up to the 34. He's 5'9", 171, but he can get the job done, can't he? Excellent vision, too. He's a guy you'd think you'd want to bounce this outside with his speed, but watch him, the little stutter, and then trusting that the blocks were there. That was a zone stretch block play to the right where the offensive line is just going in that direction. He had nice patience on that little stutter step. Marshall comes in in his stead. Mariota with time. Monk, the tight end. Midfield, 40. Still on his feet, got a block. Stiff arm gets him inside the 10. Johnny Monk, a true freshman.
232. Cameron Sutton just got shoved out of the way for a gain of 57 yards. And they are ready to snap it again. And the whistles blow. <laughs> the officials. They were trying to keep up. Fast enough. And, they, and Oregon smartly was trying to get a fast one in before the end of the quarter. Tennessee may have caught a break because the clock ran out. Football at warp speed. This presentation of college football presented by Buffalo Wild Wings will continue after this message and a word from our ABC stations. First and goal for Oregon at the Tennessee nine yard line. Now Mariota giving them the play that he got from the sideline. Option, Mariota. Touchdown. Well, pick your poison if you've got Thomas or Mariota in the backfield. It's somebody you're going to be looking at the back of their jersey a lot. And Tennessee had this defended perfectly. Jacquez Smith, the defensive end of that side, just coming back from thumb surgery. I'm not sure that the big cast on number 55's thumb didn't make that tackle more difficult because it looked to me like they... Oh, boy, they go fast. Oregon has... They got, they're going to get an illegal procedure. They weren't set before. Five-yard penalty, retry. And I'm not sure that they would have had that either. Going for the two-point conversion, Mike, that you mentioned earlier, they spread you out on their right point after touchdown attempt and threw the ball over, but there was a man moving. But I don't, I'm not sure they would have gotten that two-point conversion, so a little bit of a break for Oregon to get this run back. And now they will line up in a conventional formation. There is still a kicking battle between Wogan, number 49, and Malahandra, number 41. Wogan will get this opportunity. And he knocks it through. Down 7-0. Oregon has responded with the next 17 points. Tennessee had this misdirection read option defended perfectly. Jacquez Smith was in good position. I made the comment, maybe it's that cast on his right thumb that made him miss the tackle. He's been out since camp with that broken thumb, but I don't think if he had six opposable thumbs, he could have made that tackle. Mariota is so much quicker and faster than you think he is. Nice move by number eight. Dallas runs up on it, has to take it at the hop at the 11. Across the 20, still on his feet to the 31-yard line. We check in with Chris Cotter. And we check in with the happenings of Kyle Field, and up and down the field they go. Flea flicker this time for Alabama, and McCarron is going to find a wide open to Andrew White. 44 yards later, we are all knotted up at 14 apiece, Bama and AM. And Florida State right now over on ESPN, trailing Nevada 7 3 late in the second quarter, guys. All right, thank you, Chris. Tennessee now has to regroup from its own 31. Three-man rush. Worley with plenty of time. Throws underneath. Only gets about three yards out of that to Brendan Downs. And Oregon has decided they're not going to put on that much of a pass rush. They're going to drop eight. Let's see if they change that up every once in a while and bring five or six. They're still focused on the run, that's for sure. Worley gives it to Neal. Cut down as he reached the 36-yard line. Ekpre Olamu, one of the best corners, if not the best corner in the country, rated by the scouting services, cut him down after a short game. Full game. He can cover, he can come up and force the run. He does it all. Third down, call it five.
Four men come this time. They'll throw it to Neal in a flat, makes a move, and gets the first down. Boy, nice job by Ray John Neal out of Fayetteville, Georgia. And here is where one of the, we were talking about, is Oregon the number two team in the country? They lost a bunch of good linebackers last year. Kiko, Alonzo, and Michael Clay. Of course, Deion Jordan was a first rounder on the outside. But that time, you saw some of the depth. That's Joe Walker, a sophomore, who has to be in the rotation because of how Oregon plays, but not as good in space as some of the front line guys. Lane. Now swallowed up that time. Taylor Hart. In Tennessee with and the Alex ability. Balducci, excuse me. Yeah, with, with the ability to go fast, Tennessee changing their tempo up a little bit here. They talked how they'd slow down some to give their defense a break, but they seem to have a little something going. A little faster tempo here on this drive on offense. Lane gets the curry, the, the carry, rather. Had a hole off the right side, maybe a yard shy of a first down. Well, number 72, Zach Fulton, the right guard, is a guy who is just having a monster year. The coaches are so happy with what this senior is doing up front. And this right side of this line, uh, that's right where I would go, or at least play fake there and go the other way, because right now Fulton and James are getting, a, just like they have been from this first snap of the game, are getting a lot of push. Well, you'd think this is right in Tennessee's wheelhouse with that offensive line, third in the yard. Butch Jones worked, didn't like what he had over there. I, you know, here's a place where if I were Tennessee, I would take a shot here. I would try to go with a play action, see if you can get one over the top, because I don't think there's any chance you would punt the ball on the plus side of the field inside of uh, two yards to gain. Let's take a look at today's AFLAC trivia question. Which Oregon alum went on to become the first head coach of the Minnesota Vikings? That's a good question. I think it's the first time I've ever gotten one right. You did get it right the other night. You made it, yeah. Means I got another 10 years before I get another one. And all of this time with Tennessee on the field, allowing that defensive front, which started to look a little worn out for Tennessee on the last drive, to get some of that energy back. Neal or Lane now set up as an eye back. Eight yards deep. Now shortens up. Quarterback keeper and Worley will have it. Nick Aliotti, the defensive coordinator for Oregon. One of the most invent, uh, innovative guys in the game. They play a little different technique with their defensive line than a lot of colleges play. There's Nick there in the shades. They kind of squat down. They're not trying to penetrate necessarily, more trying to build a wall. But he says the hard ball runs downhill with big offensive lines could be a challenge. Pressure coming this time. Worley steps up and throws too high, and he had Dallas open. This was one of those ones where I think Worley got a, he, he took one too many hops before he threw that ball. He saw the receiver open. Watch this extra shuffle after Worley sees the man downfield right there. And I think that that just let the ball float a little bit. Showing pressure, they come with a blitz. He gets rid of it in a hurry, and another incomplete pass. This one behind Brendan Downs, and it looks like on the last two throws, Worley has reacted to some of that pressure. Watching him against Western Kentucky, had a tough time setting his feet against pressure. That time it looked like he got him under him. But if I'm Tennessee, you are absolutely thinking four downs here. Some type of wide receiver screen, or as crazy as this sounds, a quarterback draw, try to get this to a fourth and inside five. They blitz two in a row, now it's third and ten. They'll bring four. Worley steps up under pressure. The ball is knocked away. 
and they're going to say it's an incomplete pass. Taylor Hart, who had eight sacks a year ago, got him from the blind side. This just took entirely too long to develop. We've talked all game about how good the secondary is for Oregon. Nobody home, and Taylor Hart, a guy who he's not going to measure great when he goes to the NFL Combine, but all the coaches think he's going to scrap his way onto an NFL team. And here you are punting again on the plus side of the field on the road. I, I just think you have to go for these against Oregon. And that will go into the end zone. 11-18 to go in the half. Oregon with the lead on Tennessee. ESPN's College Football on ABC. Brought to you by Chevrolet. Find new roads. Denny's. Build your own omelet at Denny's. America's Diner is always open. And the Home Depot. More saving, more doing. That's the power of the Home Depot. Now the answer to our AFLAC trivia question, which was, which Oregon alumnus went on to become the first head coach of the Minnesota Vikings? And it was Norm Van Brocklin in 1961. He played at Oregon from 47 to 48. He was in the Oregon Hall of Fame, and they have had a slew of good quarterbacks. There's my favorite, Dan Fouts, who went on to uh, Captain Air Coriel in San Diego for a long time. But they have had a series of good signal callers, and you just get the feeling that uh, Mariota may turn out to be one of the top three that's ever played here. Maybe even better than that. Thomas. Even when they bottle him up, he gets four yards. He's a, he's a very slight young man. When we met with him yesterday, it's the first time I met him in person. He is not very big. He does not come a, you know, There's a lot of kind of shorter running backs who have broad, wide shoulders. He's very lean, but... Has the ability he, that that patience on some of those inside runs is what gets scared because he's got the speed on the outside. Obviously, Thomas comes back in the backfield. They fake it to him, and then Mariota with a strike to Josh Huff. Nice throw, nice catch. Mariota's got a rhythm going now. Huff, a guy who last year was injured, a little bit behind him, but but. but Tennessee had a coverage guy coming from that side, so a safer throw. Certainly back to the back. Mariota had a tough start, only two out of seven. He's hit six of his last seven, though. He's a very quiet guy by nature, so the coaches have been engaging him to get more involved with communication and talking to the players. But boy, he has an even keel. When you talk to him and are around him, he not much flusters him. Fakes to Thomas. Over the middle again. Huff! Wide open. Touchdown. 54 yards. That was too easy. Same play they ran two plays ago. You punt to Oregon at your own demise. The last two punts by Tennessee have led to 14 points for Oregon. Maldonado, Maldonado will come on for the point after. Out of the hold of Dustin Haynes, who makes all the decisions on whether they kick or go for two. Maldonado knocks it through, and Oregon now showing its stuff. The Ducks building a big lead here at home. Introducing a car company that's never made a single car. We took the power of a nine-year-old V8 and gave it the impressive... Oregon's speed and explosiveness has taken them to a 24-7 lead after they trailed 7-0. Matt Wogan ready to kick Vincent Dallas's deep. Had a good return the last time. High short kick. 
taken by one of the up men, and they'll return it out to the 35-yard line. Ed? Well, we'll take a look at the good hands play brought to you by Allstate. This is three receivers against three defensive backs, and as Josh Hutt rolls off the line of scrimmage, he ends up in one-on-one -on -one coverage. Unfortunately, Ladaryl McNeil takes an outside technique. You cannot let a receiver cross your face. It, when you end up in one-on-one -on -one coverage, you have to force him to either run through you or push him over the top. That, as you said, Mike, was just a little too easy for Oregon. Tennessee starts at its own 30. Neal. Pick up maybe two. Avery Patterson, the free safety with a stop. Here's Chris Cotter. Let's take it out of Doe Campbell Stadium over on ESPN Nevada and Florida State. Jameis Winston's going to find Kenny Shaw here, capping off a seven play, 92 yard drive, putting the Knowles back on top. Chris, Florida State has always seemed to have that one game that dooms them. They're hoping that uh, today was not that game. This what? is going to be a motion coming against Tennessee. Right, snap. False start. Offense number 83. No, you don't want to have unforced errors when it feels like the tide is turning like it is right now against Tennessee. They seem to have adjusted well to what Tennessee's trying to do on offense. Neal on the screen to the 35. It'll bring up third down and about five. Patterson again on the stop. Boy, that was an excellent move by Neal. Once again, Joe Walker, the sophomore linebacker in there for some depth, missing the tackle in space and making this a manageable third down. And this is a down and distance where Nick Aliotti, the defense coordinator, may want to bring one extra guy put a little pressure but he doesn't even need to this is a tough down and distance for Tennessee the last two blitzes he ran seem to shake worry a little bit big third down here you don't want another three and out and give it right back they'll run and they'll get the first down with Rayshon Neal we've seen Oregon twice in a row now doesn't it seem like if you're the other team you're always running uphill against them it, it, it was when we were talking to the coaches from Tennessee one of the things that they said was how they put stress on you all the time across the entire field in all phases and it does start to feel that way they look to Neil come back to the other side Marquez north he'll make the catch but there is a marker down back behind the line of scrimmage Jackson made the tackle, but check the marker. Holding. Offense number 64. A 10 yard penalty. We play first half. That's third team preseason all SEC center James Stone called for the hold. And that'll bring it all the way back to the 31. Neal and Lane in the backfield together in this formation. Worley out in the flat to Neal against a host of tacklers stopped at the 34. This secondary from Oregon and now seen them two weeks in a row and Virginia and Tennessee don't have quite the speed that Oregon is going to see especially as they get into their Pac-12 schedule but a lot of these long throws, the reason the quarterback's having to come down to the dump, there's nobody open. It's really impressive to watch this back end for the Ducks. Well, a lot of times they have rushed only three and dropped eight, which can give you great coverage. But you're right, Ed, the secondary has done a special job so far. Worley again on third and long, no pressure. And throws and misses his tight end, Brandon Downs badly there's just nobody nobody open of course it's second and 17 so they did only rush three and drop eight but 
Oregon, Oregon secondary just looks like they're in control. Usually the secondary feels like they're backing out, having to guess. These guys stand flat-footed, read things, have great eyes. It's tough for a young quarterback on the road. Worley had downs open for what could have been a game of 10 or 12. But was off target. Three-man rush again. One of them gets through. And the pass to the sideline almost picked off and then caught by Marlon Lane, who went out as a wide receiver. Now, has Butch Jones seen enough of punting to Oregon? I think you, ha you have to go for these down in distances. And here they go punting again. Right now, Oregon has punted three times in this game and netted 21 points. So I understand this is old school play some field position. But if you want to win this game on the road, you can't keep punting it to the guys in that yellowish color. Here it is, it is anti-everything you've ever been taught or anti-everything you've ever coached. Uh, it's a different game. It, it is. really is. It is, I understand. Punt goes into the end zone, 54, but not that much of a net. And the worst part for Tennessee is Oregon gets the ball back. Now let's take a look at our Pacific Life game summary with Oregon on top of Tennessee 24 to 7. Ball struck first. Whirly, 8 out of 14, 94 yards. Mariota, three touchdowns, 231 total yards. Huff has 88 yards receiving. Marshall. Picks up five, maybe six. And this is where Tennessee's defense, I think, may start showing some wear and tear. They've been out there quite a bit. I mentioned that Mo Couch not here. Looks like a Tennessee defender is down. It looks like Don Tavis sat starting outside linebacker. They're already missing Kurt Majit, linebacker out with a knee injury suffered against Western Kentucky. But, of course, uh, Mo Couch, who was... Reporting a Yahoo Sports report that he received extra benefits, according to the report, from a agent. And so Butch Jones and the staff deciding to leave Mo Couch at home this week. So they're already down a defensive lineman and now going against an offense that is starting to put its foot on the gas in Oregon. It looks like they may be down another linebacker and Dante Davis Sapp. Let's check in with Janine. Yeah, and the Tennessee defense certainly doesn't need any more hits, guys. I can tell you what, they know that Oregon's MO is getting to the edges. They need to do a better job of walling off those edges, and Steve Stripling, the D-line coach, has been very upset with them not staying alert on every single play, like the play that saw Josh Huff score that touchdown. So he wants them to not take any more plays off. Can't afford it against these guys. Mariotta on the run. Munt, his tight end, has already had a couple of big plays, and the big fella rumbles across midfield. 6 4, 232, a true freshman. He has four catches for 104 yards. Getting all of this run because Colt Lyrela, the multi talented junior tight end who plays everywhere, not here for an undisclosed reason, and Munt making the most of the opportunity. That one overthrown by a half a step intended for Addison. Covered well by Justin Coleman. And here Tennessee ru running in four new defensive linemen. Doing whatever they can to get new bodies on the field. And Oregon looking almost leisurely. On this drive. <laughs> and Oregon gives you so few opportunities. A long incomplete pass. One of the few. Tailback Byron Marshall out of San Jose, California, which is their prime recruiting ground for this program that has just grown and grown and grown. Now they are trying to sustain the level that they've reached, and an excellent level it is. Addison, flanker screen, can't stay in bounds, and I think they're going to get Josh up for a hold. Well, that was one of those plays where Tennessee flat out did not line up. They had one defensive back over to cover three receivers. Mariota That's couldn't not good. <laughs> Mariota was so excited, he couldn't <laughs> get the snap fast enough to get it over there. Holding. Offense number one. Ten-yard penalty. You play third down.
Boy, it was that late. Justin Coleman going over there. But Coleman does a wonderful job. Give Coleman a lot of credit. Yes, sir. He was completely out of position, but he played the play. He played it physically, and Huff ended up grabbing his jersey and throwing him to the ground. Nice job by 27 for Tennessee. He's thinking to himself, it's me against them, huh? One. Marshall. And now for Tennessee, the bad news is you still have to stay out here. This is outside of the range of the two kickers for Oregon, Maldonado and Wogan. And so for Tennessee, it, and they go so fast. Here they go, ready to snap already. Don't know what they're going to do. They don't even hesitate. Mm -mm. Mariota wide open. Daryl Hawkins walks in. a former quarterback they made him a wide receiver and one of the problems for a defense against the hurry up offense is you finish a play then you get back to your spot and you're not sure what the defense is so you stand there and wait and somebody blows by you and it's over Wogan for the point after Well, this time, Justin Coleman makes the mistake of going to the swing route, completely letting the receiver, Daryl Hawkins, run by him. But that was a mistake on what the assignment was. That's what Oregon does to you. They think Oregon has hit warp five on this offense. They have stunned Tennessee after the Vols took a 7 0 lead. It's now 31 7. Short kick again out to about the 30 yard line. Tennessee will start from there. One of sports' greatest rivalries will continue on Sunday night baseball. It's a big matchup. Robinson Cano and the Yankees try to keep their hopes alive when they go against David Ortiz and the Red Sox. Yankees and Red Sox tomorrow night at 8 on ESPN as well as on Watch ESPN. And that wild card race in the American League is something else. So, so are these guys. You yeah, said this is an awesome offense. Said the warp speed went to 5. I think the warp speed actually goes to 11. <laughs> Oh, I didn't say they were done. <laughs> yeah, they've got another. They've got more on the top end, huh? Yeah. They haven't turned the meter up yet. Ray Jean Neal with a couple of yards. Now, if you're a play caller for Tennessee, I mean, what are you thinking? We, we've got to take, you know, we've got to make this possession last a while so our defense can rest. But still, if we, don't we have score, to get yeah. something out of it. It was Mike Bajakian who came from Cincinnati with this staff. A good core of guys who've been together since the Central Michigan days went to Cincinnati. But I think, I think you just have to call. You have to stick with the run game as hard as it is because I'm just not sure you have the receivers and quarterback to get back from this. Worley after the fake. And this was an offense for Tennessee, of course, Tyler Bray, who was the starting quarterback now with the Chiefs, also named in that Yahoo Sports article about taking legal benefits. But uh, this offense last year was really good, and they just lost a ton of guys. They lost four, a tight end and two receivers to the NFL and a quarterback to the NFL, so just not quite the players they had last season. Third and long, four-man rush. Worley on a run, throws underneath. That's going to be short of a first down, complete to Vincent Dallas, but three yards short, short of the sticks. Troy Hill with a nice tackle. Now it's four for four in punts for Oregon to score touchdowns. Let's see if Oregon goes five for five. I, I know that it says you, sh you should punt here. You're on your own side of the field, but you just get a sense the way Oregon's going. They may be able to punch another one in here before the half. Braylon Addison is the deep man. He waits at the 20. Nice kick from the 16. Braylon Addison, one man to beat. 
just tripped up as he got to the 45. Justin Coleman saved it after a 30-yard return. How many game breakers can you have on well, one team? We had Virginia, uh, Oregon at Virginia last week, and the coaches kept talking about Addison. I'm not sure Addison has the top end speed of the Anthony Thomas, but he runs really hard. He does not go down easy. He's good in space. A much stronger guy than he appears. Looks like he has a slight frame, but he is awfully difficult to tackle. And I, I know they're all tied Personal together. Foul, hitting the player out of bounds. Receiving team number one. That penalty will be enforced half the distance of the goal from where the kick was caught. First down. That's Josh Huff, and that's a huge penalty because they take it back to where the ball was caught. They don't mark it off from where he ended up, and they take it half the distance to the goal. But the thing about their kicking game is not only do they have brilliant return men, the blocking appears to be exceptional. Top of your screen, Josh Huff, as you force the player out, once he's there, you can't hit him again. You, you can push him out of bounds, but then you can't make the hit but you got to wait for him to come yeah. back and then you can pop up again but when we were talking to butch jones he and his coaches when they were studying oregon they said you start looking at the quality of this program and where it really shows up and how good they've gotten with their depth of talent is on their special team yeah they have a bunch of frontline guys because they're second stringers especially on defense play a lot of defense they have guys with a lot of experience and they can be very dangerous. So Oregon backed up inside its 10. Mariota throws and complete to Addison. We check in with Janine. Guys, if you watch Mariota between series, he's often sitting with the offensive line, listening to their coach, Steve Greathouse. He usually says very little. He might shake hands with his teammates, but that's about it. But I have never seen a quarterback sit between every series with the linemen. Coach Halfridge told us it's to help Mariota be more connected with his teammates because he's a very quiet kid, and they've actually had to pride, prod him to speak to his team teammates after every snap. And it's something he's really working on. The rest of the stuff he's got, this time he's blasted in the backfield, knocked down. Corey Miller, number 80, the left defensive end, will get credit for the sack. Mariota, very lucky he held, held on to that ball. Looked like he was going to go make a throw, but was able to tuck it back in. Mariota sits in the pocket this time, throws underneath to Thomas. Look at all that room he's got to run. DeAnthony Thomas takes a hit out of bounds, no flag. I'm not so sure you shouldn't throw a flag there on Cameron Sutton. He He's clearly out of bounds when he was contacted. Wasn't much, but he was clearly out of bounds. Well, it was a little closer than I thought, actually. It was the first leg down out of bounds. But that's, you've got to keep your head up. We talk about safety all the time. Sutton ducks his head and really can't see what's going on in the play. Mariota. Gets the defensive back to come up to meet him and then throws the perfect strike to Huff, who shows us he probably would be pretty good in the high hurdles. How do you defend Mariota when he can do this? It looks all to all the world like he is going full speed to get the edge. He reloads it and throws a strike. I, I would say the accuracy was pretty good on that throw. You know, he was responsible for 38 touchdowns a year ago. As he gives it to Thomas, Thomas waits on his blocker and then turns on the speed. Are you kidding? Behind his left tackle, Tyler Johnstone saying, come on, big fella. Let's go. Let's get downfield and find somebody. Then he set up the block and then he took off. That looks inbounds to me the whole way. Oh, boy. They did the very, very similar move last week against Virginia to get into the end zone. This one, I don't think they're going to have to review or held because, unfortunately, for Tennessee, one of their defensive linemen is down. He, I think he's as good when he's slow as when he's fast. Oh, I do too. He has that ability where you're not sure what gear he is in. It looked, there was no way he should have gotten the edge no. in the sideline there. But it was the slowdown waiting for John Stone and his block the that Tennessee really made man it happen. down on the play. The one thing I think is going to hurt Mariota and Thomas when it comes to national recognition is they're not going to play any fourth quarters. 
they may not play most of the third quarter. It's going to hurt their numbers, and yet when they're in there, they are unbelievable. The numbers won't get to, remember Johnny Manziel's numbers last year? Yes. He played, I forget the num more number of staffs than Marcus Mariota because they were in every game and Manziel had to play to the end. So no doubt those numbers may hurt. Well, here in this half, Mariota, 350 yards so far. Thomas has 81. Huff has 116. And Month at tight end has 104. We'll take a break. 119 to go before the half. We'll check on the Tennessee injury when we come back. John Saunders and Jesse Palmer will have the Cooper Tires halftime report. They can take up the whole half showing Oregon offensive highlights. And unfortunately for Tennessee, it looks like Trevera Salisbury. Defensive lineman, he had a sack earlier in the game. Of course, we mentioned that Mo Couch is not here. Pending an investigation into whether he received improper benefits. So this defensive line, which is already worn out and already down 37 to 7 getting it looks like potentially another man thinner. Maldonado will come in to kick the point after presumably. And Tennessee I don't know what you feel like if you're wearing orange and white, but they just gotten stomped on by the speed of the Oregon Ducks. I think his face says exactly how he feels. I don't think Butch Jones is hiding very much. How could you? Yeah. Seven with 119 to go in the half. And I think if you're Tennessee, you have to come out and let Worley try to work the hurry up and get something going. I know you only have the one timeout. You used the two earlier, but you have to, for if for any other reason, that's something you're going to need to work on for later in the season. Dallas for a running start from the five. Taken down at the 26. Well, we'll see what Tennessee chooses to do. The old school in me says, Take a knee. Come on, yeah, run three <laughs> plays, go back to the locker room, and let's talk about it. Well, it, I said this last week. It really, when you start to see what Oregon does and the variety of things they do, not just on offense, but the defense plays a little bit different, the special team stresses you. It really does feel sometimes like you're watching the Jetsons play the Flintstones. <laughs> in, in the way that they go, it just feels so modern. Worley hands it off to Marlon Lane. I've got a better way. Make sure Oregon's not on your schedule. Yeah. And for Tennessee, unfortunately, this is the start of a run of games. Oh, their schedule is just grim. Of course, they've got the protected game against Alabama because of the tradition between Tennessee and Alabama. Oh, thanks. So that's yeah, the thanks so much. We get that's the team we get from the West every year. Yeah, we appreciate that. And that's what they're going to do. They just want to. Get into the locker room in one piece as Lane gets into the carry. Marlon Lane at the middle for three. It'll be third down two at the 35. Of course, Oregon last week against Virginia used the timeouts brilliantly at the end of the half. Now they wouldn't be able to get the ball back. But remember, they made Virginia take that last snap yes, and almost did. got a turnover. They're going to force you to play. There's no doubt about it. It's about making more plays. That, that's the goal of what they're doing. Let's just play more plays and see if we can't beat you. If we, the more times we roll it out, the more chances Oregon has to run by you. What a first half performance 
the Oregon Ducks after they fell behind 7 nothing, lead 38-7. Here's Janine. Mark, after a somewhat sloppy start to the game, you guys are rolling now. In what ways have your players made the best adjustments? Well, I think we just kept playing. You know, this is a Tennessee, as we said all along, is a, is a really good football team, and, and our guys just need to keep playing. Had a little adversity there, had a couple uh, situations that, that we can correct, uh, had a touchdown call back, but we played through it. What do you want to see your guys do a little better in the second half? Play the next play. Everything. Everything. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Janine. At the half, our score is Oregon 38, Tennessee 7. When we come back, John Saunders and Jesse Palmer catch you up with the Cooper Tires halftime report. This presentation of college football brought to you by Buffalo Wild Wings. All right, guys. Welcome to ABC College Football, presented by Buffalo Wild Wings. Marcus Mariota, sophomore quarterback. We play fast because it's our, our culture. DeAnthony Thomas, Jr., running back. Like we're bringing a whole different flavor to the game. Welcome back to the University of Oregon, where it's 38-7, Oregon on top of Tennessee. The Volunteers will get the ball to start the second half. Vincent Dallas, the deep man. Good kick drives Dallas four yards deep. He'll bring it out of the end zone. And it's whacked as he gets to the 13. Oregon came in this week number two in the nation. Tennessee was a heavy underdog. But if you looked at Tennessee and the strength of this team with their offense, it looked like they would have a chance to move the ball against Oregon as the officials are checking out the flag that's down. And we'll wait for that call. formation kicking team number 14 with more than five yards beyond the restraining line five yard penalty re-kick so they'll kick it again but we we really thinking about this game and the start that Tennessee got looked like it was gonna be a pretty good ball game wrong I mean yeah. Oregon's just so good it, it, it we were talking last night at production meeting it kind of looks like a video game when you watch these guys play and, and watching Tennessee against a quality opponent in Western Kentucky I saw a lot of reason for this game to be close but unfortunately Oregon comes out they go three and out they miss a field goal they kick a field goal and then they go five straight possessions with a touchdown I'm not sure what you tell your team at halftime other than play the next play that's all you can do if you're Tennessee it's all you can do playing against yep. these guys just play the next play and try to win it and see what happens there they are just a blur on offense and if you're a defensive player we saw it three or four times guys got back to their position looked to the sideline and by the time they knew what the defense was going to be somebody had just blown by them and that guy happened to have the football so we'll try the kickoff again Dallas from the four and shy of the 25 as we take a look at our Pacific Life game summary. Well, as if Oregon doesn't have enough, and Marcus Mariota, who has 362 total yards in a half. Great run there. Looked like the zone read was dead. But then the step up of Johnny Munt, the true freshman, stepping in with Colt Lyrela out for an undisclosed reason. The true freshman comes up and then Josh Huff, a young man who struggled last year with injuries, but they've always known he has big plays in him there for Oregon getting in. I think if you're Tennessee, you have to run the offense that you know is going to work for you the rest of the season and not look at this scoreboard and say, all right, we got to throw it 50 times in the second half. And frankly, they just don't have the experience at wide receiver. Uh, the quarterback is still starting to, still getting into the flow of knowing this new offense. So I, I just don't know that Tennessee even has the ability to just spread it out and start to throw it and try to come back from 31 down. Rajon Neal is the tailback with Worley. 
play action fake. Blitz coming. Worley unloads, underthrown, and incomplete. And we'll check in with Janine. Well, Mike, you and Ed were just touching on what Butch Jones may have said to his team in the locker room, and it's exactly what Ed said. You just got to keep playing. He stressed to his team resilience and perseverance before the game, and he brought it up again at halftime. He knows that a third of his roster has never been on the road before. It's a learning experience, but he said we've got to make Oregon earn everything, and hopefully we can get into some kind of a rhythm. What a place for your first road game, huh, Janine? Pressure coming again. The pass over the middle is going to be shy of a first down, even though it's complete. Up to the 28-yard line. Good tackle by Terrence Mitchell as Marquez North, who was the number two wide receiver rated by all the national services coming out of high school. Nice catch. Ball thrown a little behind him there in traffic. And it's worth mentioning the bang-up job that Butch Jones and his staff did coming in late and getting a really nice recruiting class. Polardi to kick to Braylon Addison. And again, they get a good sideline kick. They don't want him to get the return after he broke that big one on them. 45-yard kick, no return. The Ducks in their last five drives. Look at that. The longest one, a minute 55. They went 37, 78, 80, 80, and 92 yards, all of them under two minutes. And I think what you would say is, well, if you're not playing that many plays, why is your defense tired? Because when you add it up, it's not a lot of time of possession. I think there's as much physical strain if not more, I think there's more potentially mental strain, and I think that's where the defense gets tired against these guys, both physically and mentally. Mariotta throws to the sideline, and they're going to say Addison stayed in bounds for the catch at the 43 right in front of the Tennessee bench. And Oregon going fast, so just in case the Replay officials want to look at it. Look clearly like a catch, though. Addison again cuts it back, makes two or three guys miss, and then is swarmed by the defense. Oh, nice job of keeping the feet down. He's got it both down. That's good in the NFL. Only one foot in college. Showing off there. Mariota in trouble. He'll throw this one away. You know, the idea of, of playing the next play, it's almost like Oregon has taken that to another level. They, their players just seem completely in control all the time. You just don't see guys lost or confused. There's just a, a really bright team. Straight drop. Mariota completes to Hawkins. And Hawkins will have enough for a first down at the Tennessee 44. Talking to Mark Helfrich yesterday, and he mentioned the last five recruiting classes that the Ducks have brought in. Every single member of all five classes has qualified academically. Remarkable. That's that's unheard of. Usually there's two or three guys over a year or two, you're gonna have two or three guys that don't qualify. Go five straight years, he says. Pretty pretty amazing. Shows the quality of people that this program is able to go out and recruit now. And it's great from an academic standpoint, but it's also great from a football standpoint. Because if you run the offense the way they do, you've got to have smart people who can absorb what they're trying to do on offense. And they have to be really fast on the uptick. You think about it. If you're playing wide receiver for Oregon and you go out and you run a long route, you have about 13 to 17 seconds to do a bunch of things. See the play coming in, understand what your coaching point is, looking at the defense to see if it's going to change, and then right before the snap realizing, oh, yeah, now I have to go really fast. They, they ask a lot of these young men, and it is really impressive to see how well they do it. Blitz coming, Mariota runs out of trouble. And then some. And to further emphasize your point, it's going so quickly on offense, at least they know what the call is. If you're a defensive player, you don't know where they're going to go. You've got 30, 13 seconds to get back to where you're supposed to play defense. Look to the sideline, hope to get the call, hope to take a breath, 
And then you've got somebody like DeAnthony Thomas, who probably runs a 4-2, coming right back at you. And the Tennessee coaches, that's what they talked about, was the pre-snap confusion that Oregon is able to get the opponent consistently into a position where there's just that, that half a second of hesitation. Mariota with a fake, there's Munt wide open again. And the big guy rumbles into the end zone. Have a day, Johnny Munt. Oh, not bad for your first start. Five catches, 121 yards, two touchdowns. He looks the part, doesn't he? Doesn't he? Catches the ball well, runs great after the catch. I think Munt will fit in nicely for the rest of the season. I would imagine 83 will be a part of the game plan going forward with his showing. Now, we will be looking ahead to the rest of Oregon scheduled in this game and try to identify somebody that might be the real true test. We thought it might be Tennessee. Turns out it's not going to be 45 to seven. That drive, their slowest in the day. It took them two minutes and three seconds to score. Mariota, 396 yards in the air, four touchdowns, 19 out of 20. And I bet that won't last long either. Not bad for a guy who started two for seven. <laughs> Vincent Dallas, driven six yards deep. He'll take a knee. Check into the studio, Chris Cotter. Let's check in with what's happening down at College Station. Johnny Manziel, his second pick of the day. This time by Vinny Sunseri. And look at this return. Makes a couple of sweet moves. There's one right there. Finally gets a block inside his own 20 yard line. Takes it to the house. Tied, rolling AM right now, 35 14, early second half. When they were so hopeful in College Station. Lost a lot of guys defensively, though. They did. A&M last year. I, I know that was a defensive touchdown, but Alabama looked like A.J. McCarron's having an awfully nice afternoon. Nick Saban does pretty good in revenge games, although he won't call them that. Everybody else might. <laughs> Gain a four from Marlon Lane. Lane again on the handoff from Worley. He about two and a half yards shy of a first down. You know, we're talking about play the next play, get ready for the rest of the season. This is actually an excellent opportunity for Oregon's defensive front. It is. To get work against teams like Stanford that they're going to play later in the year that are going to run the ball directly at them. So this is an excellent opportunity for Oregon against a fine offensive line with a few guys that are going to play in the NFL to get some reps against a power run team. Yeah, remember, if you joined us late, we pointed out that four of the five offensive linemen for Tennessee were voted by the Southeastern Conference coaches to either the first, second, or third team all-conference. You're talking about four guys out of the top 15 offensive linemen in the SEC. Richardson, first team. Fulton and James, second team. Stone, the offense of the uh, center. To the third team. Buller didn't bat either. The starting left guard. I mean, this is a massive mobile offensive line. Honors candidates across the board. And this is something you want to see what your defensive line and your linebackers at front seven can handle because Stanford is the prototype of that downhill running football team that really broke Oregon's heart a year ago. You know, one of the things that Oregon tries to do is to defend your run with less people. You know, you hear all the time, oh, get extra people near the line of scrimmage. Get them down into the box. On that last play, 
there were four Oregon defenders in the box for five offensive blockers. That's one less in the box than you need to defend the run. Worley with the out to his tight end, Brendan Downs. So instead of eight men in the box to defend a good running game, they had four. And, and what the way that they do that is these three defensive linemen are actually responsible for six gaps. Because they're playing what's called a two-gap technique, which means they have the gap to either side of the offensive lineman there, they're uh, defending. Now you have less linebackers. You see a ball that gets out to the edge. All of the Oregon jerseys out there because they've been able to walk guys away from the line of scrimmage because they actually had one less in the box to defend the run. So the defensive line holds everything up and then you rally to the ball. Get big guys up front, let everybody else be 220 pounds or under and run really fast. That's, that's the theory that Nick Aliotti is trying to build here. It's easy to say, hard to do, it really is. but you can see how they have done it against this powerful offensive line. And this defense, it's one of the things that's really hard when you're getting ready to play Oregon is that technique. It's watch their defensive linemen. It's almost like they squat down like frogs. And they're actually reading the helmets of the offensive line and just trying to build a wall. It's an incredibly difficult technique to learn. It's very hard for a team to get ready to play it because you don't have anybody on your team in Tennessee that knows how to play this technique. Blitz coming this time in Worley's face under throne. Nick Aliotti has chosen to blitz very few times, but when he's done it, it has been tremendously effective. Well, that's the, you get ready to play Oregon and you think that they are a read and react front, but they do have the ability to put their hand on the ground, get some weight on there, and also bring the blitz. So they can play two different styles of defense up front. That's difficult to prepare for. Third and long, you would have to think they're in four down territory barring a sack here. Four man rush, Worley just off target. Off the fingertips of Josh Smith, who was running a crossing route. But here comes the punt team. The hard part for Tennessee, I, I think they're going to be better defensively as the year goes on. I think this offensive line will continue to be good. I'm just not sure that Butch Jones quite with a, they had a good recruiting class, but I'm just not quite sure. They're not ready to roll out any, either of the true freshman quarterback, Riley Ferguson and Joshua Dobbs, that they recruited quite yet, but uh, I'm just not sure they have it on offense. Nice end over end punt with that backspin on it because you kicked the point of the ball down to the 11. 31 yards on the kick. ESPN's College Football on ABC. Brought to you by Pacific Life. For insurance, annuities, and investments, choose Pacific Life. The power to help you succeed. Kellogg's Frosted Flakes Cereal. They're great. And AT&T. Rethink possible. Oregon gets the ball back up 45 to 7 and one of the things that Marcus Mariota talks about is the pre-snap numbers game this last year against Stanford as he surveys the field this is a zone run to the right but he sees he has four defenders for the two blockers to that side so even though the offensive line is going to run the play to the right the two defenders for Stanford are out covering three receivers the hard part for the defense you still have to play the zone read the offensive line runs the play. The ball comes back to the other side for an 11-yard gain. That's the hard part about playing defense. Stanford in that one was thinking we have the run outnumbered, but unfortunately you leave two to the other side. It's an automatic read for Mariota to come back to the wide receiver screen. So hard to defend. Straight up the middle goes Byron Marshall. And I think really that's one of the things that this offense and some of the other modern spread offenses has done, Mike. You, you can never come off of your guy. You may think it's going one way, but it may come right back to you. You know, Huff knocked out of bounds. Teams used to line up, and you knew two or three places they were going to go with the ball. Right. You knew the receivers they were looking at. You knew where they liked to run it out of those formations. And now you just have not a clue. Mariota just became the first Oregon passer to go over 400 yards since Kellen Clemens did it in 05. 
And then we'll check in with Janine. Well, Mike and Ed, that's only half the battle with Oregon is fighting their schemes. The other half is their tempo. You know, we joke about them making it difficult for us to get much in between snaps, but their coaches have the same problem. Offensive coordinator Scott Frost told me efficiency of communication is paramount. They'll adjust quickly between series, and then they will line up seven or eight plays in a row, and I'll finish after this. Down to the 28 goes Marshall, the swing man out of the backfield. Back to you, Janine. So they'll line things up like airplanes waiting to land, and once on the field, Frost will use play calls of only two to six words. But it's not just Oregon. The Tennessee coaches have simplified to one-word calls for today. And we have, I think, hit warp nine at this point. <laughs> and it's like a face mask on top of it, and the only thing that does is give Tennessee a little breathing room. Yeah. You have to be so good on defense, and, and, and I'll go back to the point that... Personal foul, face mask, defense. That penalty will be enforced after the, with the goal with an automatic first down. So many defensive coaches, and the question I usually ask them is, how do you stop a really good, like this, spread offense? Four down linemen who don't need any help to rush the passer. Four corners, legitimate corners, guys who might have a chance to play on Sundays. And then you go get them. Who's got that? Nobody. There's very few teams that... Everybody says if you could line up enough good athletes to play man, you can defend this. Problem is you just don't... They, I don't even know there's NFL teams that have that type of uh, talent. Well, Chip Kelly would say they don't. She looked like the other night. That pass intended for low, broken up. Justin Coleman, good defense. And boy, the, the Oregon fans took a lot of pride in what the Eagles did. They, they use a term around here called the Oregon way. And I was reading some of the local papers of how proud they were that the Oregon way seems to be translating. Now, I think he may have to slow down a bit with a 53, 45-man roster. Around the corner, Marshall. Touchdown. The officials looking at each other, deciding did he have his feet in? Did the ball get past the pylon? The answer is yes. Another touchdown. Yep. Looked to me like he did. Brian Randolph got to be a little careful there. Didn't quite drop his head didn't look like he was targeting but that could have been close we know it's been called pretty cautiously this year Oregon rings the bell again 52 7 over Tennessee let's see if we can get one pass the chase to the cup officially begins tomorrow at Chicago and Speedway NASCAR's best start the 10-week battle for the championship now 13 drivers as they added Jeff Gordon there will be one champion the Geico 400 in Chicago tomorrow it used to be if you could cheat and get away with it in NASCAR that was just fine it was a good old boys sport I really love what they did here people tried to get away with some stuff NASCAR clamped down and tried to make it fair for everybody I think it was a great move Brian France did a tremendous job Certainly hasn't hurt in the publicity department. It was a big topic of discussion all week on Sports Center. This is going to be a big topic <laughs> of discussion, too. How good is Oregon? It's really hard to tell at this point. I, I think Tennessee is a solid opponent, but uh, they have a stretch coming kind of middle of October, end of November. Oregon does. Where I think the, I, I just haven't seen them tested yet. But. Dallas, who has been a busy young man, the kick return front will go into the crack at it. Two yards deep this time. Has a seam. And he gets it out to the 27. Of course, Oregon, everybody was asking that last year. Last November, they played host to Stanford. Late regulation, the Cardinals, fourth and one, kept the drive going. Then Kevin Hogan hit Zach Ertz, and the replay showed it was a touchdown and tied the ball game. In overtime, Oregon had the ball at the one, but Maldonado's kick at the upright. And after that, Stanford's Jordan Williamson did not miss and gave Oregon their only loss of the season, 17 to 14. As you look ahead, is Stanford the team that they have to worry about here? I think they're... It, it, 
Washington, UCLA, and Stanford look to me like the only teams that might be able to give this Oregon bunch everything they can handle. I'm not, not totally sold on Washington yet. We'll see what the outcome is with Illinois today. I don't know that Boise State's as good as they have been in the past, but that October 12th at Washington, Washington State, and UCLA gets a huge win today on the road against Nebraska. Very emotional win after losing a teammate over the weekend. And then at Stanford, that to me makes this season for Oregon. That's a pretty tough run. And uh, of those teams, I think Stanford or UCLA, I think have the best chance of beating them. But I tell you what, you let it become a track meet against these guys, you have no chance because nobody is faster than these kids. And that's what's interesting. You look around the Pac-12, you think everyone's kind of spread out. But that's what Stanford did to Oregon last year. Stanford has done an amazing job of building both incredibly good offensive lines and very big and physical defensive lines. And so we were talking about how you defend the Oregon defense. Well, Stanford's getting close to having those four defensive linemen that can do it all themselves. Well, I'll give you an example of what I think Oregon did today that was very, very smart. Last week, we saw them against Virginia. As this pass is incomplete, thanks to the big hit from Reggie Daniels. We saw them run a lot inside against Virginia without any success. We talked to Scott Frost, the offensive coordinator this week, said, are you committed to the run inside? You can keep it going. He says, well, we want to run inside. That's part of our offense, but we're not going to call it just to call it. If it ain't working, it ain't working, <laughs> and we'll go somewhere else. And that's what they did against Tennessee. It wasn't working early, and they said, fine, let's go elsewhere, and elsewhere provided really big chunks. It helps when you have number six, the Anthony Thomas. Oh. He, he really is a spectacular player. Pilardi to kick it away and again an angle kick trying to keep it away from any return and we'll check in with Janine Edwards. Well guys last month Butch Jones had a friend of his speak to the team. Eric Spelstra the head coach of the NBA champion Miami Heat. The two men met through their agent and Spelstra happens to be a huge college football fan. Spelstra told the players of the parallels between the volunteers and the Heat because you know when he took over the Heat they had won just 15 games the season before. He said his favorite quote is that man's greatest fear is in death. It's irrelevance and how building winning habits leads to success. And Janine that's what you have to have to build it from where you have hit rock bottom and certainly they had that is Thomas Tyner. The young man who is in a tailback now, and Jeff Lockie is the new quarterback. So the superstars, Mariota and Thomas, are done for the day after brilliant performances. For Tyner, it is his birthday today. He is 19 years old. When he was 18 years old, as Lockie is, uh, has it on the keeper. When he was 18 years old, he probably didn't have enough breath to blow out the candles on his birthday cake because in the game he played, he ran for 643 yards and had 10 touchdowns. That's in one game. I don't think he's going to match that on his 19th birthday, but he well, they is, got a quarter and four minutes to go. He is the guy they are looking at and saying just a tremendous talent. State record holder in the 100 meters. Would seem to fit like a glove in this offense. Guy who battled the left ankle injury in camp, so wasn't quite ready in the first game against Nicholas State. Rocky, after hesitating, completes. Nice cut block that time by the freshman Thomas Tyner on the uh... personal foul, roughing the passer. Defense number 95. A 15 yard penalty will be added to the end of the play. First half. That's Danny O'Brien. The pass was complete to Chance Allen. And then O'Brien adds another big chunk of yardage on the roughing Lockie penalty. Ooh. The helmet to the chin. Very, very lucky he didn't get a targeting penalty, although the contact didn't seem to initiate in the head or neck, but probably the right call just with a personal foul, not targeting with the ejection. Tyner takes it to the 18-yard line. 
Now, if you're Tennessee's defense and those first teamers are still in there, you're thinking pride. You don't want to be shown up any more than has already happened to you. Tyner again with a good block from Armstrong on the corner. Well, the hard part for Tennessee is with the lack of depth, they don't have a lot of third, second, or third stringers they can actually roll out there. So, for Tennessee, you've got to start being concerned about some injuries to your frontline guys. Tyner knocked out of bounds to three. There's a funny story written about Tyner that they, they talk about the Oregon way. If you're a young player, you're not supposed to have a big head. You're not supposed to be able to think about, you know, I'm I'm as good as it gets and I just want my chance. One of the linebackers laid him out in the middle of one practice, according to the article. Neither Tyner nor the linebacker would confirm it, but everybody was smiling when they were not confirming it. Tyner again. Well, they have built a really competitive program because of the the amount of players that they play on both offense and defense not a lot of guys get bored around here because you're going to go in the game very soon in your career if you're any good going at warp speed again tyner to the goal line touchdown I'm not quite sure he made it, but I'm not sure if they're going to review it either. I can't tell. Uh, I don't know about you. <laughs> Too many bodies in the way. I mean, Tyner's 5'11", 211 pounds. Oregon, which came in averaging 62 and a half points a game, up to 59. A lot of time in this game to go. Oregon with that explosive offense, trying to reach their season's average. 62 and a half through the first two games. They have 59 right now. Actually fell behind Tennessee. 7-0. This week, Yahoo Sports reported five SEC players may have received impermissible benefits from agents and financial advisors. The biggest name was former Alabama star DJ Fluker, but former Tennessee quarterback Tyler Bray and a current volunteer, the defensive end Maurice Couch, were also named in that report. Couch was ruled ineligible by the school for today's game. He is not with the team. Couch apologized on his Twitter account on Friday, saying to his family, friends, and volunteer nation, I'm sorry I let you guys down. There's a drop for Tennessee. He's had a chance to pick up a first down. They've got a new quarterback in there, Nathan Peterman. Redshirt freshman from Fruit Cove, Florida. Young man who battled with Justin Worley all the way through camp. It was actually a four quarterback competition yes. with the two freshmen, Riley Ferguson and Joshua Dobbs also in there. But Peterman, a guy who's worked extremely hard, never let his foot off the gas when he's made second stream. The coaches have been very impressed with how he's worked to improve himself after being named second string in the fall. And those two Freshman recruits Riley Ferguson and Joshua Dobbs part of that uh, good recruiting class That Butch Jones had in his first year remember he got a late start after they replaced Derek Dooley And this is a program that won a national championship under Philip Fulmer then when they had a couple of bad years Tennessee decided to part ways with him a decision they probably regretted not soon after they did it then Lane Kiffin took over and then Derek Dooley and now they're almost starting from scratch Flanker screen by Peterman got it out to Marquez North and North stopped shy of a first down. Well, you've been mentioning the recruiting class that Butch Jones and his staff put together on short notice last year. This year, with just the verbal commits they have, every service has Tennessee in the top three in recruiting. So 
if you're going to do it this guy has tireless energy the staff consistency actually very similar to Oregon even though all the Oregon coaches have been here this staff for Tennessee the core of it at least has been together since their days at Central Michigan before they went on to Cincinnati and had such great success Tennessee will kick it away and Chad or Chad Delaney bringing it back for six yards and for more on that Yahoo Sports report here's Janine well Mike Tennessee athletic director Dave Hart told me that he cannot comment further on the investigation although they are in the midst of a thorough investigation but that investigation has found that no current or former coaches or staff knew anything about the situation with Maurice Couch and Tyler Bray now they expect their investigation as well as the NCAA's looking into the matter to be completed rather quickly as for Maurice Couch he is suspended until further notice it may end up being for multiple games but they are hopeful that his suspension will be a short one and Janine after a report like that the school has to be so careful if they play a kid before the investigation is finished and it turns out he was involved in something then you've used an ineligible player and you've got to start forfeiting ball games well that's the, the big part of this story of course is DJ Fluker who was a starting offensive tackle for Alabama's national championship team last year and that would be right. the concern if you're an Alabama fan is what's that outcome but for Tennessee as Oregon now bringing in Jake Rodriguez it is kind of a, a two-headed second string situation for Oregon Jeff Lockie and Jake Rodriguez are both tied for the number two spot so trying to get Rodriguez some run here before before the quarter runs out, but they'll have to wait to the fourth. We'll see how the red shirt freshman does this presentation of college football presented by Buffalo Wild Wings. We'll continue after this message and a word from our ABC stations. Interstate rivals will square off on ABC Saturday Night Football. Brian Kelly's 21st ranked Fighting Irish aimed a rebound against Daryl Hazel's Boilermakers. Saturday Night Football presented by Windows tonight at 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific on ABC. Jake Rodriguez, number three, is your new quarterback. And let's see how fast uh, Mr. Rodriguez can run this offense. You're all the way down to... Your second string, Lockie and Rodriguez, the two quarterbacks sharing that second string duty as Lockie got a little bit of run. Now Rodriguez gets his. But this is a good time for a young quarterback to learn how to manage it, how to get going fast. And well, this just seems like they've uh, hit the pause button on the video game here for a second. Ayele Ford is the new running back. He wears number 30. So third and five. Ford on the carry. Shakes one tackler. Cuts back. Runs into more trouble. Still won't go down. Finally swarmed inside the 25. And that tackle there made by A.J. Johnson. This is a guy, you watch him on film. Number 45 for Tennessee. He is such an active guy. You mentioned he led the SEC in tackles last year. Watching him take on offensive linemen, how quickly he gets to the ball. I think this guy's Got a very bright future, just a junior for Tennessee. And the coaches said, we just can't have A.J. Johnson making every tackle. He needs help. He needs another 10 guys out there playing with him. First time they've had to punt since the game's opening drive. And they cover it perfectly. Tennessee will start from its 26, 42-yard punt and no return. We mentioned Philip Fulmer, and I will never forget the cab driver who picked me up at the airport when we were doing a Tennessee game late in Philip Fulmer's career, and he said, Philip Fulmer's just a 10 and 2 coach. <laughs> well, I got rid of him, brought in Lane Kiffin. He was there only one year, and then Derek Dooley struggled to a 15 and 21 re record, 0 and 15 against top 25 opponents, and that was probably the thing that did him in. Well, the Lane Kiffin show up and bail situation was really disastrous for this program. Yes, I, it was. We covered Tennessee several times two years ago, and I got to know Derek Dooley and his staff. And still can't really quite figure out why it didn't work for Dooley better. But two years after Lane Kiffin left, there were two members of the recruiting class left 
that Lane Kiffin had signed of over 20 yeah. young men. And so that year with Lane Kiffin really set this program back a bit. Lane is the tailback on second and a yard. And Lane will get to carry. Cuts back a couple of times and drives his way out to the 49. Let's check in with an update from the studio. Mike, the AT&T All-America of the Week. Let's nominate UCLA quarterback Brett Unley. 16 to 24, 294 yards and three touchdowns through the air. Add 61 yards on the ground. The Bruins beat up the Huskers. Get involved. Text your vote for the AT&T Player of the Week to 34763. Mike. Thank you, sir. Tennessee trying to get something going here with 12 and a half minutes to go in the ball game. Smith, the new tailback. First down. And third teamers in there now for the Ducks of Oregon. Isaac Dixon made that tackle. If you're Tennessee right now, you just want some success. You want some stuff to go right for you. So you have a better taste in your mouth walking out of the stadium. And if you're, if you're Oregon, you want a fourth quarter with the clock runs the whole time. Yes. Tom Smith dives forward to the 40. Unfortunately for the volunteers, things are not going to get much easier. They're at Florida next weekend. They get South Alabama. And then look at that. Georgia at home, South Carolina at home. And then that protected game, that... The traditional game protected between Tennessee and Alabama, which, I, you know, I know the SEC wants to, if they're going to stay at eight games, though, in conference, they're going to have to change these protected games. I, they're going to have to go to nine games in conference for this stuff to balance out. It's just a little unfair how the East and West shakes out with their scheduling at the moment, I think. Yeah, I think there's a lot of conversation about it. It just has to. They have to go to nine games. Pac 12's there. Big Ten has announced that they're going to go to nine conference games as we get to the last year of the BCS and then we get into a Final Four situation playoff. I think the conferences that are not playing nine games are really going to be hurt when people start talking about what type of season they had and start choosing who those four teams are. And I, there, If you look at some of the schedules in the SEC, it is completely unfair the differences in conference that some teams have I to agree. play, and I think that has to change. DeAnthony Summerhill will get a chance, number 24 for Tennessee. Second and about eight. Summerhill on the carry, taken down, got back up. I'm not sure his knee ever hit the ground. No whistle. And Summerhill fights his way for positive Anthony's yardage after he was caught in the backfield. And the hard part for Tennessee with that schedule, Mike, they come out here, and I, I don't know that they ever had much of a chance. As soon as as soon as soon Oregon turned up the volume, they just kind of ran by them. But it's going to be really hard. Butch Jones has he, a great focus, great energy. But just to continue, guys, to that, he, he wants guys married to the process, not the result. Boy, they're going to have to really focus on the process with that middle of the schedule. Well, they're not going to face anybody like this, certainly. It would be more old school style of football. No, no easier, but certainly different. This pass incomplete. Outstanding coverage by Troy Hill, the corner. Hill is a very good cover guy. He's in that rotation of fine cornerbacks between Terrence Mitchell and Ifo Ekpre Olamu. And this was wonderful coverage. You stayed up all night one night for Ekpre Olamu. <laughs> Got that one down perfect. Yeah. Well, a guy who's that good, you better learn the That's name. That's true. Fourth and long. Tennessee trying to keep the football. Blitz coming. They picked it up well. Peterman throws and has it complete to the 27. That should be enough for a first down. Good throw by Peterman. Good presence in the pocket as well. Jacob Carter made the catch. Peterman shows he's got some arm strength. Handed off this time to Summerhill. And, and for a guy like Peterman, this is huge time for him. Sure. It, he was locked in a battle to try to win the starting job. Justin Worley won it. So for Peterman, if he can come out and 
manage the game, throw the ball a little better than Worley. Worley had some struggles early in this game. Some accuracy, maybe he gets a chance to uh, open that competition back up. Tom Smith is back in as the tailback. Peterman taking a lot of time getting that call from the sideline. Smith. Nice little misdirection cut and then blasted by Isaac Dixon. Gave as good as he got and picked up the first down. Isaac had to be a little careful there. He ducked his helmet. That was not a defensive player, so you can't get targeting at the head or neck area. But if you drop your helmet and hit with the crown, you can be called for the 15 yard penalty and ejected. Smith, nice cut. Smith inside the 10. Let's go back to that last hit. There's two different rules. There's targeting a defenseless player at the header net. Clearly not a defenseless player. But the, watching it in slow motion, though, it's amazing how often they get this right. That time Isaac Dixon, even though there was contact at the head, the player was not defenseless, and the only way it would have been a penalty is if Dixon had lowered his head and hit with the crown. So a good no call there, because in full speed, it looked like to me that that might have yeah. been targeted. The officials, of course, don't get the benefit of that replay. Mm -mm. Nice cut to the outside and a touchdown for Tennessee. Ray John Neal. Check it. It was number 30, Alden Hill, who gets the carry and picks up the score. Not too often you get to see a number five tailback carry the football. It's not often you come play Oregon if you're Tennessee. <laughs> <Yes. either. laughs> Touche. <laughs> Pilardi for the point after. And if you're Tennessee, you had to be so hopeful after that first score. Things were going so well. It's been a long time between touchdowns. Let's take a look at our Pacific Life game summary for this intersectional contest between Tennessee and number two Oregon the volunteers scored first but after that it was an onslaught from Oregon Mariota 483 total yards five scores Thomas rushed for 86 a month and his first start had a huge day at tight end Ducks returning the kickoff. Looked like Devin Allen on the return. Instead, Troy Hill had the opportunity. We'll be back to Oregon after this. ESPN's College Football on ABC brought to you by Buffalo Wild Wings, the official hangout for NCAA football. Buick. Visit your local Buick dealer to see why thousands of people are switching to Buick. And Cooper Tires. Tires built for your life's everyday road trips. Come on, let's go. The impressive detail in Oregon's new Hatfield Dallin complex does not end with the more glamorous areas of the building. Even the parking garage is impressive. Got artwork on the walls. Here's the other stuff. The garage is nicer than the first apartment <laughs> I ever had. But this building, it is it is stunning. If you're within 100 miles of here, it's, it's worth your trouble to come over and take a look at it. It's the most magnificent thing I've ever seen as an athletic facility. The, the football facility looks more like a modern art museum. Yes. Than it does a football facility. It is quite impressive. Rocky is back in at quarterback. Well, if you've got a tie at number two on your depth chart, rotate him in and see if anybody separates themselves. Kenny Bassett got the last carry. I think both coaches right now are 
more interested in keeping the clock running than anything else. It's a nice time for your younger players. Get out there and get some real snaps. But you, you know, when you talk about Oregon and, and their players, not Mariota, not playing a lot in the second half, as we get into the Heisman race in November, of course, looks like uh, Johnny Manziel may be taking a loss after playing what didn't look like a great game against Alabama. But the numbers, Mariota had a, a huge, huge first half, great numbers. But as the season goes on, uh, because Oregon may blow out some of their op uh, opponents, may start to hurt him. There's two INTs by Manziel, one of them return for a touchdown against obviously stronger competition yes. though it's hard to believe that Johnny Manziel was an Oregon commit at one point isn't that so yeah he committed to Oregon Mark Helfrich actually was doing a tremendous job recruiting him and, uh, would have been in the same class as Marcus Mariota but to Manziel's credit he always said that if Texas A&M called that was where his heart was and he would go. He was very upfront and honest with them. And when Texas A&M eventually did call, uh, he answered. Mm -hmm. And Mariota was a guy that when they went looking, when Mark Helfrich again went looking at uh, some talent in Hawaii, Mariota was and he was a guy who only started as a senior in high school and he looked at the film and he said well, How's everybody missing this guy called Chip Kelly and they actually had a camp an off-season camp where Marcus Mariota and Johnny Manziel were both quarterbacks in a high school camp here at Oregon So he vote, vote, invited them both and we asked Alfred what was that like and he said that was that was a pretty fun camp for us if Mariota only started as a senior with the skill that he has, can you imagine the guys who were starting before him? Yeah. It's like when Barry Sanders was at Oklahoma State. What good he enough? He didn't get yeah. to start until he was a senior. Yeah. Barry Sanders turned out to be a pretty good running back. Well, the guy ahead of him is in the NFL Pro uh, Hall of Fame in Thurman Thomas. But yeah, this was a Johnny Manziel. If he had not been recruited by Mike Sherman, who coached before Mike Sumlin to A&M, may well have been a duck. Lane Roseberry gets a call. It must be about the sixth back. The interstate rivals square off tonight on ABC Saturday Night Football. Big game for the Fighting Irish looking to bounce back against the Purdue Boilermakers. Saturday Night Football presented by Windows tonight at 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific on ABC. Hope you'll tune in for that one. Butch Jones, former team Cincinnati, beat Purdue in their first game, but the Boilermakers bounce back with a win. And then Cincinnati lost his quarterback. It was a little tough. Yeah, tough much of a goal. Yeah, that's him after that. Tough, tough injury. <laughs> Salisbury again, and it will be third and about five. How long of a flight home is that to Knoxville after a game like this? Long. Yeah, yeah <laughs> you, you have to be able. You, one of the one of the sayings of many from the head coach of Tennessee, Butch Jones, is snap and clear. Play the snap, then clear your mind. They're going to have to do a lot of clearing their mind to get back on task. I, but I, I really like this guy. He, boy, the energy and enthusiasm he brings, it's easy to buy in. Well, as we said earlier in the ball game, he's been a head coach for six years and won four conference championships in those six years. You can coach if you win four conference championships in six years. I don't care what level. And, of course, he followed Brian Kelly at both Central Michigan and Cincinnati. And a lot of people would say, well, he won with someone else's coaches or with someone else's players. But that, that doesn't. That doesn't add up to what type of coach this is, and also the staff that he's put together. They're shorthanded, no doubt. But I think in the next four or five years, especially if they continue to recruit like they're recruiting, I don't see how Tennessee doesn't get back in the mix in the SEC. Uh, he's got a proven track record, and given, given the right amount of time, he's going to succeed. That's what he has done throughout his career. 44-yard punt, no return. Two minutes, 46 seconds to go, Oregon in total command. Every month, thousands of people are switching to Buick's innovative technology, design, and luxury. How are they arriving at this decision? In Lexuses, 
Acuras, Hondas, Infinities, Toyotas. In the national rankings with an impressive win over Tennessee, the Volunteers will take over with 246 left to go in the game. And trying to get outside. Alden Hill. Two top-ranked teams highlight ESPN's primetime doubleheader tonight at 7. Vanderbilt against Jadavian Clowney and the 13th-ranked Gamecocks of South Carolina. And 10.30, James White and the Badgers of Wisconsin face the Sun Devils defense. Both games on ESPN as well as live on Watch on ESPN. Big news for Arizona State when Will Sutton, their fine defensive tackle, decided to come back for another year. So a couple future pro defensive linemen on those games tonight. Hill again. Lowers his shoulder and picks up four. Chris Cotter with an update. Chris? Central Florida giving Penn State all they can handle on the road and Beaver Stadium. Here's Storm Johnson's having a big year for the Knights. Going the distance, two touchdowns for Storm Johnson, 14 to 7. Central Florida on top. Coming up tonight, 8 o'clock on ABC, Notre Dame and Purdue. The Boilermakers gave the Irish all they could handle last year up in South Bend, Mike. All right, thanks, Chris. Clock running, 125 left. Nathan Peterman in the shotgun. Delay to Hill. And Hill has another first down out to 35. Clock will stop temporarily and then a couple of running plays and this one should be over. Here's the remarkable play of the game. Presented by Oregon Community Credit Union. Well, for Oregon, I, I'm not sure yet. I, I want to say they're the number. I think all the teams in the top five or six have flaws. And I know this is being a little nitpicky, but early on they can look a little sloppy, they being Oregon. And their front seven on defense, although good and athletic, I, I'm not sure that linebacker core is quite where they were last year. So if there's a few things, maybe a team like Stanford or, or Washington, who seems to have an offensive line that's getting way better than they were last year, maybe they can challenge these guys. Let me suggest this. Off of what I have seen from their offense, I don't particularly care what their defense uh, is. It's, it's pretty amazing. Their offense is remarkable. Yeah. And to think Marcus Mariota started out two for seven. They went three and out, had a missed field goal, and then they just put their foot on the gas and went right by Butch Jones from Tennessee. And then, as somebody once said, boom, went the dynamite. <laughs> they turned it up to 11. Oregon a winner over Tennessee, 59-14. We'll be back to Oxen Stadium after you listen to this.